Hey, Adam. Hi, Joe. Hi, friend. Hey, Stacy. Hey, uh, quick question. Have you guys heard that the Air Force is recently uh, seeking out a thousand retired officers and enlisted airmen to voluntarily put the uniform back on? Uh, and I it came across my desk and I thought, no, thank you. Would you guys um, would you guys ever consider joining your services again? You know, that's interesting absolutely not. That. No, absolutely not. I, I, for me, it's, it, you know, they, you always hear the term, you, you join to serve your country, but you, you fight for your men, you fight for your fellow, you know, military members. And, and with those guys out now, I just, you know, if there was something else I could do that didn't require me to put on a uniform again and, and, you know, run three miles every once in a while, I probably would be interested, but, but probably not. If you could say, hey, Adam, well, we've pre-flighted the Apache. It's gassed up. Your flight plan is done. We have one of the best, uh, you know, uh, warrant officers uh, because we know you've been out of the aircraft for a long time. We don't want you to kill yourself, but you can get in and fly the Apache again. Then 100 percent. But uh, I think just to, to go back in. Um, no. And can we also say that like. Did we just let the Air Force get off with with no jokes, getting back in, into the uniform here? Well, I like, mean, the, I mean, I, my I, I spiraled for a minute. I was like, okay, I, I, fortunately, I can still squeeze myself into the uniform. However, I know for a fact that um, I get winded just running on the other <laughs> end of my um, driveway. So the, I would never pass a PT test. I'm curious, like of the retiree pool. How many are actually fit to fight? Okay. I just want to intersect here and say that I'm pretty sure the length of your driveway is a Navy PFT. Probably. Yes. This I, is I think that's exactly. a, a mile and a half run. <laughs> Look, I was doing some push-ups this morning and like the, the pain I have in my shoulders. I'm like, how did I do like 60 of these in a row at one point? Like I'm Complete on my knees. Disregard doing... for your future self. That's how you Adam, do it. Adam, I think you're looking at this wrong. You probably have pain oh. in your shoulders because you did 60 of those. <laughs> oh. Yeah, and reverse engineer that one, bud. Could never max the push-ups. Well, hey, Alphas, if you were Air Force, the Air Force is a call and voluntary retired return to service program. Go on, click it, and we're going to get this show started. This is the Tango Alpha Lima Podcast. They call me crazy because I'm facing all my giants. They try to scare me into thinking I can't fight it. They tell me I should never even think of trying. But that's just me. I'm going to live out in defiance. Welcome, Alphas. Thanks so much for joining us. We've got a great show for you today. Our guest today is going to be Ry Barkat, co-founder and CEO of With Honor, a cross-partisan nonprofit organization that fights polarization in Congress. That's quite a job. But before we get to that, Adam's got something new to share. Thanks, Joe. We've got another new segment today. We're inviting the Alphas to send us uh, over their burning questions, questions about the podcast, the American Legion, whatever. You can literally ask us anything. So send your questions to us at tangoalphalima at legion.org. The first question we're going to tackle um, today comes from a question posted on one of our social medias by Mark Russell. So Mark's question is, are there any commitments like meetings and so forth that you are required to do? So I'm assuming that he's asking, are there uh, any commitments like meetings to be a part of the Legion that we have to do? When you become a member of the American Legion, you're supporting programs that help veterans, service members, their families, and their communities, even if you never step foot inside a post. So I guess that the easy answer to this is uh, no, you, you're not required to attend a meeting. But I also think about it of like, why even join the American Legion if you're not going to go to the meetings and support? And I know there's a lot of other ways in which you can support. So I don't know. What are your guys' thoughts on this? I guess I'm one I, of those I, others because I don't go to meetings very often. Mm. I, I, If I felt like I could really bring something to the table and there are times when there's big votes, when there's things going on, I, I, I like to be involved with things like that. But really, it just signing up is is an action. And, and it seems like it's not, 
you know, that you can always do more, but I think we can always do more with everything we do. But what's really important is the more people we have there when the American Legion steps in front of Congress and says, hey, this is what veterans need. You've made promises. We've got, you know, this many thousands of people that are are backing us up and these are all your constituents. And these are, you know, that's that's where some of the power of the American Legion comes in is this unity that we have as people across so many different walks of life that that say, hey, regardless of everything else we've got going on, like we want to take care of veterans and you promise to do that. You represent us. Yeah. I think Mark to your point as well. Um, you know, I'm not much of a meetings person, but I am an actions person and I'm one of those like bleeding heart kind of people. And, um, one thing that my post does particularly is they go to the VA and they visit with, um, the folks who are in the home who don't have other people visiting them on a routine basis. And so they will do little drives for socks, cookies, things like that, and just go and sit and visit with them. And that to me, I think is really, really fulfilling. But, you know, as Adam and Joe said, you know, there's the administrative part of it. There's the legislative part of it, which is a big part. But um, at the end of the day, if you are on the fence, you don't know where to go, become a member. Your, your dues are going to be going to a really great cause. And, um, if you still don't decide to use the American Legion in any way, at a minimum, check out the veteran service officers because it's free of charge. So they will help you with your VA filings and disabilities and all that good stuff. You, you right, know, great and, stuff, and- Stacey and Joe. Yeah, the last thing I was just going to add, and then I'll defer back over to you, Joe, is you know, you guys gave some great examples of of things that you can do. And, and that's like really the core of what we're asking you to do. And that is look and see all the incredible you know programs and things from the le- the halls of congress and the in the legislative efforts that we do to the things that are happening right there in your community and if there's something in your community that's service oriented and aligned that you want to see happening well that's a, gr- a great thing to to stand up and and maybe show up to a meeting and and rally some people around it so i think it's kind of a, a choose your own adventure and we want you to to get in and fit in uh where you feel like you know you want to be I, and well, you don't you even have, have to join a post, but like you said, getting involved is really like that camaraderie is really a big part of the things that we miss from the military anyway. So I think that you would definitely benefit from joining a post and getting involved, but you don't have to, and you still have access to all the benefits of being a Legion member. You're just a member at large of the national headquarters. So, um, you know, you still get, you still get the discounts and, and, you know, eligibility for financial assistance and things like that. And, uh, you know, the monthly magazine, that's your thing. Um, and, and, and on top of that, a lot of people don't know this, but you don't even have to be a member to receive benefit claims. If you're, you know, if you're a veteran, you talk to a Legion service officer and they, they help all veterans free of charge, which I love Absolutely. because, yeah. yeah, I mean, a lot of these, a lot of like nonprofits focus so hard on individual things like post nine eleven or Vietnam vets or you know, and that's one thing I think that's great about the American Legion. It's a Perfect. great, it's a great question, Mark. We really appreciate it. So that's it for this segment of Ask Us Anything. So please, if you have a question, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to discuss it. And we want to talk about the things that are important to you. So uh, send us your questions to Tango Alpha Lima at legion.org. Okay, Alphas, please stick around. We're going to be right back with Rye Barcott right after the break. Did you know that hearing loss and tinnitus are the top service-connected disabilities and that treating hearing loss may lead to improvements in cognition and depression? When Surgeon General Dr. Vivek Murthy presented his framework for a national strategy to advance social connection last year, he expressed his commitment to combating the significant health consequences of isolation and loneliness, which he referred to as an epidemic. And for people who have trouble hearing, Strong connections can help mitigate the many potential negative health effects of hearing loss. The Heroes with Hearing Loss program, provided by Hamilton Captel, supports veterans facing the challenges of hearing loss by sharing solutions that keep us connected. One of those solutions is Caption Telephone, allowing veterans to listen and read what is said over the phone, making it easier than ever to connect with those who matter most. As a part of the Heroes with Hearing Loss program, Caption telephones are available at no cost for veterans. For more information, including eligibility requirements, visit heroeswithhearingloss.org. The American Legion and WellCare are partnering to give our veterans more. 
WellCare's Medicare Advantage plans work alongside your VA benefits, and that always means you get even more of the benefits and support you need. But it can also mean a brighter smile, clearer vision, or sharper hearing. Find out what more means for you. Visit WellCareForVeterans.com today or call 844-917-1165. Want a health plan? A plan offered by WellCare Health Insurance of Arizona, Inc. WellCare is the Medicare brand for Centene Corporation, an HMO, PPO, PFFS, PDP plan with a Medicare contract and is an approved Part D sponsor. Our DSMP plans have a contract with the state Medicaid program. Enrollment in our plans depends on contract renewal. Arizona DSMP plans, contract services are funded in part under contract with the state of Arizona. New Mexico, dual eligible special needs plans members. As a WellCare by all well DSMP member, you have coverage from both Medicare and Medicaid. Medicaid services are funded in part by the state of New Mexico. New Mexico Medicaid benefits may be limited to payment of Medicare premiums for some members. Notice, TenCare is not responsible for payment for these benefits, except for appropriate cost sharing amounts. TenCare is not responsible for guaranteeing the availability or quality of these benefits. Any benefits above and beyond traditional Medicare benefits are applicable to WellCare Medicare Advantage only and do not indicate increased Medicaid benefits. Indiana DSMP prospective enrollees. For detailed information about Indiana Medicaid benefits, please visit the Medicaid website at www.in.gov slash Medicaid. WellCare by All Well, HMO, and HMO SMP includes products that are underwritten by Superior Health Plan, Inc. and Superior Health Plan Community Solutions, Inc. WellCare, HMO, and HMO SMP includes products that are underwritten by WellCare of Texas, Inc., WellCare National Health Insurance Company, and Select Care of Texas, Inc. Hey there, Alpha. Today we are joined by Rye Barcott, co-founder and CEO of With Honor, an organization that focuses on promoting and advancing principled veteran leadership in order to reduce political polarization. Wow, not only is that a mouthful, that is a big job, my man. So thank you so much and uh, welcome to Tenga Alpha Lima podcast. Thanks. We like to say, you know, we've been at it for five years and clearly clearly we've done a hell of a job. <laughs> no not, not quite mission accomplished. <laughs> not quite. Well, hey, Ryan, and, um, I'm First of all, Rye, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your service. Um, I know you by reputation, of course, and through your nonprofit work with the CFK and the With Honor, of course, as Joe mentioned. And um, I'm really excited to chat with you because uh, this has been in a, a conversation in my house with my fellow veteran and husband, Andy. We talk about the the bipartisan um, and the polarization of politics right now. And I, it, it leads me into saying that when I was young, one of the first lessons I was ever taught was uh, never talk politics or religion in mixed company at parties. And um, I think I've, I've heeded my parents' advice, uh, but in today, you can't even talk about politics or religion in your own home without sparking, you know, some, some very, very... Uh, how do I say like high energized feelings? So what I find so compelling about what you're doing um, today is um, makes me think about our time in service. So Rai, um, we served alongside people from mixed backgrounds from all over the country, um, various you know religious points of view, political points of view, and for somehow, we managed to collaborate and get the mission accomplished. Essentially, I, from what I, my takeaway is, that's what you're doing today. Can you talk to our alphas about what you're doing and, and how it, and how effective it's been so far? Thanks, Stacey. Yeah, great to, great to be on. I'm also a lifelong legionnaire and the American Legion has been a fantastic partner with, with honor. I started the organization five years ago. I co-founded it with another Marine that I had served with in Iraq. And, uh, and then David Gergen, who's been a mentor for many years and had served in the Navy and really has uh, pioneered a path of high character service across party lines, which of course used to happen a lot. You know, uh, Congress itself used to be 70% veteran. It's now down below 20%. Uh, 50 years ago uh, and all the way up to about 20 years ago, uh, the majority of Congress were vets and the place functioned better. It was more effective because people worked across party lines and got things done. And when we actually measured how vets voted across party lines over that period in American history, before we started the organization, we found that statistically the vets had acted in a more bipartisan way. That's not to say that all are bipartisan, plenty are hyperpartisan, especially these days. It's it's hard to avoid uh, that, uh, as you mentioned at the, at the dinner table. I mean, everywhere you turn, you can get hit by a culture war. Uh, but what we do as an organization is we really focus on three things, which is recruiting and training principal bets who will be committed to this pledge. And the pledge sounds 
simple, but it's actually really difficult in an environment as dysfunctional as Congress to serve with integrity, civility, and courage, and especially the courage to actually be a workhorse, not a show horse, and work across party lines and actually pass things that matter for the for the um, country and for the world, frankly. I'm about to go to uh, Ukraine later this week with a bipartisan congressional delegation that we're pulling together, bipartisan, Democrats and Republicans, uh, to to actually work these these serious issues and not just jump into jump into the next uh, uh, you know soundbite. And the sound bites are easy. I mean, the, mm-hmm. the incentives are, you know, make your soundbite, throw it out on email, start raising small dollars on it. it the, the incentives are not to try to actually roll up your sleeves and get things done. Um, but this group now, there are 30 members in the in the four country caucus, FOR country caucus. It's bipartisan, uh, roughly 50-50 across party lines. And almost all of them are, have served in Iraq and Afghanistan. We actually have two that are Vietnam vets, uh, two of uh, only three Vietnam vets that are that are left in Congress. And that group of veterans has passed over 150 laws to date, uh, some of which we've worked with the American Legion on in particular. Uh, most frequently, the uh, or most most recently, the 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 effort to get the assistance that our Afghan linguists and um, and allies need that are here in the United States. But, uh, that. but yeah, that's a little little little, little snapshot on with honor. Man, thanks for covering that, Adam. I think I'm going to pitch it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. I think it's uh, so fascinating and so needed uh, right now in our country. Um, over the last few years, and, and now as the uh, I'm the director of operations for the Veteran Mental Health Leadership Coalition, and so we advocate for veteran mental health legislation at the at the state and the federal level. So I've gotten to start seeing, you know, how the sausage is made, you know, so to speak. And so I can now say from personal experience that the work you're doing is so important, and uh, I'm really interested to to learn more about that. But what happened to you specifically along the way in your life? Um, that made you decide to focus on this? Like, what what was it about building these bridges across these difficult divides that uh, appealed to you? Was it your time in the Marine Corps? Was it, you know, something, you know, that that shaped you kind of younger in life? So what was it for you? Thanks, Adam. Yeah, my, uh, my, my mother, uh, a lot of this goes back to, for those of us that are fortunate to have had uh, two great and loving parents, which I did, uh, a lot goes back to our parents and the foundations that they set for us. My dad is a Vietnam vet. My mother is a, an anthropologist and a nurse. And she actually gave me the middle name of Mead, uh, as in uh, Margaret Mead. And uh, my my mom and dad were very independent thinkers. Uh, they never they didn't push the military on me. Uh, you know, in many respects, Vietnam for my father was uh, both one of the most challenging as one of the most important things that he did in his life. He served in 1965. He, he volunteered for it um, miraculously, which shot through the face and survived uh, as a Marine reconnaissance um, uh, officer. And my mother and father both said, listen, get out of your comfort zone. You know, l- l- you, know li- you have two ears for a reason. You know, listen to how people around the world that are different from you uh, live and think. And they exposed me to some, some different cultures as well. And so it was that experience initially with them uh, and, and, um, you know, just seeing frankly, how much, uh, individuals have in common and how much really talent there is around the world. Uh, there's this great saying that, that, uh, that I love, which is that talent is universal, but opportunity is not. And, uh, you know, the military, of course, as we all know, is, is really a, a Petri dish of, for this, because it is a, it is a, um, uh, it is a almost identical reflection of America when you look across all branches in terms of demographics, socioeconomic status, um, you name it, religion, ethnicity, et cetera. It's sort of how Stacy, you started off the, the conversation is that it doesn't matter where you're from, you have a common mission and you're you're serving it. And so the, the Marine Corps for me really reinforced the ability to to cross lines and get things done. And and then you know just stepping back, a lot of vets and I'm sure you all, I mean, you talk about this on the show. And of course, this contributes a lot to, to mental health, um, the mental health crisis. A lot of vets, you know, we struggle once you get out of the uniform, put the uniform down, just in terms of like looking for purpose and larger mission, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, it, it is a privilege to be able to uh, work on missions that matter. In this country, I can't think of many problems that are more significant for us than 
our polarization. It hits us in the face every day. Um, and I found a way, and I've sort of approached this throughout my life of just looking at ways that where can, where can I make it, where can I start or create something that's different that builds on something and adds value in the world. And so I had uh, come out of an experience with another Marine. We had, we had built a business, um, sold part of the business, and he decided to run for office. And that was my prompt uh, back in 2017. Uh, we saw that there was a surge of vets running across the country from both parties. Uh, most of them had uh, two things in common. One, they were vets. And the second was that they were not, you know, independently wealthy. <laughs> and running for office, especially for Congress, uh, takes a lot of resources. And so we started off organizationally, really just as a political organization, to try and help build a, a critical mass. And once that initial group of 19 vets got in, uh, 10 Democrats, nine Republicans, uh, they started this four country caucus, which started to really move the needle on things. One of the first bills incidentally was the 988 number uh, that my uh, friend from the Marine Corps, Seth Moulton. Oh, wow. Uh, led on, uh, Thank with you for that. Yeah. yeah, 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 really like, you know, making a, making a big difference and, and not easy. Like not, just because something's a good idea doesn't mean that it will pass Congress these days. In fact, you know, most of the time it will not. <laughs> um, oh, thank, thank you for that, Rye. Uh, uh, appreciate it. And, you know, what I really hear there is how you took your lived experiences and then trying to be of continued selfless service, you know, looking how you can bring together people of high character service to create a, a need that's, that's really kind of unmet in our divided country. So th thank you for that. Um, Joe, I'll turn it over to you, brother. First of all, man, I, great hair. I, I love your look. You're doing it all right. But no, seriously, I, I love what you're doing. Uh, I really do. You know, you're pushing vets to leadership roles. You're pushing people to work together in Congress. You're working to break cycles of violence in Africa. You've got the Carolina for Kibera. Like, you're somebody who does, there's two types of people. There's talkers and there's doers. And sometimes the talkers give the doers ideas. You know, but it seems to me like you're doing both. And I, I love that, you know, person of the year profile for ABC. Look at you, man. You know, and, and pushing people to vote for, you know, while they're young to create habits and creating these habits. So, you know, I, I love that. So, you know, when you have, when you put these people together and you were somebody who is a doer, it's very frustrating when you run into people who try to tell you that you can't be bipartisan, that, that there's these hard lines between. So, how do you handle people who push this divide and will literally say someone whose politics does cross lines are cowards? You can't be middle of the road. You can't be someone who is uh, fiscally one way and socially another without being called out as somebody who just can't pick a side when, when, you know, I think that it's becoming clear that this isn't working. Yeah. Uh, how do we handle those people? Yeah. Well, I mean, you, that, that is, uh, you, you're so on it. I love the word, doer um and that's what you try that's what i've tried to be is, is somebody that can get stuff done but but the only way that you get stuff done is with others uh and and oftentimes it's not a lot of people it's just a small group that stays committed that perseveres and that that pushes through the work with with honor has definitely tested perseverance i mean uh it is it's super frustrating uh and it's 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 it, at, at times you know to work across uh the party lines and like just stay grounded on okay that we got something larger here let's not let's not go down the road of getting triggered by you know whatever it is that is trying to trigger us or some statement that somebody makes um the main way that that we have done it and that i've done it and stayed true to it is one by seeing the results of like what is possible i mean the advantage of when you're dealing with a place that's super divided is that a small group of people that is actually united can have disproportionate influence. And that's what's happened with the, the four country caucus of 30 members is that there's just there are just very few platforms anywhere in Congress where these members are even talking to each other, let alone actually getting anything done. And this is one of them. And so that's that that creates an opportunity. The other piece is, is just a basic human nature thing, which is let's focus and let's start the relationships and the conversations on what we have in common. And fortunately, that's where the veteran identity comes in. You know, we're not an organization that's saying we just want to have more veterans in Congress to have more veterans in Congress. No, it's a, it's a specific commitment to fighting polarization with a, folk, a group of folks that 
happen to be the almost the only group in the United States right now uh, that has trust across party lines are military vets. And, you know, we had a one of our first military, one of our first advisors on our board was a World War II vet and a Korea War vet named uh, John Warner, a wonderful person, senator from from uh, Virginia. Uh, and and he he took me back to what it was like after Korea, because he said that there was there was not respect for the, the vet. And of course, we knew what happened after Vietnam. So this can be lost as well. This is a pretty sacred space that we operate in, where we can cross these divides. And we have um, we have to you know respect that and then build on it. And sometimes it, it's it's your own people. You know, some of the, the problems that that Korean Vietnam vets had were with other vets that, you know, that were and, and you know, that's a whole nother conversation to say. But I, I just want to say I love I love what you're doing, man. And I like, you know, you, you said a quote that said optimism is a force multiplier. I love that you're holding on to that because I know that it's not something that, that it, it can it has to be a choice every day and it gets easier well, to make that choice. But that's just incredible. Well, and, and you know, that was um, that was cool and pal. And yeah. Oh, yeah. he said, perpetual optimism is a, a force multiplier. I mean, I just love that, love that line. And it's interesting, you know, in, in, in this line of work, you see a lot of polls and surveys. We just um, uh, initiated a first poll with the firm Ipsos, which is going to be an annual unity poll, which looks at what actually unites Americans instead of divides us. Mm. Uh, because most Americans actually want the same things out of life. But we all perceive that we are more divided as as ever. And uh, there's really only one veteran that has from from our sort of contemporary time that has name ID and uh, and and also high high level of respect um, across uh, above 50 percent. And that was Colin Powell, you know, mm -hmm. obviously in peace, but um, but a, but a giant figure for 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 our generation. And uh, appreciate yeah. you, man. Yeah. So, Stacy. Yeah, so um I think that's really great to bring up because we veterans, I think we could be perfect strangers, right, Rai? We could meet at each other at some function and I find out you are in the service and then I was in the service and suddenly we're cool. It doesn't matter what our belief systems are, what our what we personally believe. Um, we know that we were we served together, we have a, a shared experience, some may say shared trauma. But um, well, I guess what I'm getting at is when you guys have the um, these the caucus meetings that it's made up of all these veterans, is it kind of like that where it's like a party of brothers and sisters having a little reunion? Or is that is that me completely projecting my own personal experiences? Like what is the what are these meetings like? Are they cordial? Are they a typical sort of political kind of debate? And how does the caucus decide what legislation or how they're going to set the 2024 agenda? You know, how did you come about choosing um, Afghan refugees as being one of the, the highlights? Great question. So the four country caucus is it's is a you know official caucus in Congress. There are so many caucuses in Congress. Most don't do anything. Uh, this one is one of the few that has a staff behind it that meets every two weeks. And so the meetings themselves are generally pretty pretty formal meetings, but private so that the members can actually have real conversations and ask questions in a trusted environment and not have to worry about the one of one of their peers going out and talking to MSNBC or Fox and burning them right afterwards. So they will oftentimes bring in a, a guest speaker. The next meeting, for example, has the commissioners of a congressional commission to look into the biotechnology security threats that are on the horizon. And this was a commission that two of the members of the caucus, one who I mentioned previously, Seth Moulton, and the other one, Mike Gallagher, helped initiate this commission. So the commission's coming in and they're talking about these uh, alarming uh, uh, advances in technology that uh, create national security threats. And then there'll be a conversation. It'll be about an hour. And from that, we are looking at like tangible legislative actions that can that the that, that can be put into place and that will stay bipartisan. The 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 <laughs> I had somebody ask me uh, because it's DC, of course. They said, "Well, what is your special interest?" And 
I was thinking to myself, what do you, well, what do you mean? You know, our, our special interest is the country. It's, it's the United States of America. But, uh, but Washington, of course, is a place that is rife with special interests. So, you know, oftentimes, you know, interests of an organization trying to get their nugget across the goal line for, for their um, stakeholders. In this group, it is purely what can we achieve for the country, hence the four country caucus, that can actually pass and not just pass the House or be a messaging bill, but get past the Senate and then signed into law by the, the president. And that's what they've done on the, these 150 items, which basically fall into uh, three broad buckets. The first is national security, which is the natural area for them to work on. Um, almost every weapons deal that's that's happened through Congress has um, has had the caucus working on it uh, from the very beginning. For example, um, the caucus has led on many of the recommendations from another commission that looked at artificial intelligence three years ago uh, and was sort of starting to look around the corner on that. The second area is a is a passion area for the vets, and that is uh, to expand uh, voluntary national service and civic education. The national service is one of those few areas that do unite Americans across party lines. But interestingly, less than 1% of Americans now serve in the military and less than 2% serve in either the military or the civilian or, or civilian form of service. And we think that's really a problem and a challenge for the country because service can uh, unite us and, uh, and carry us, you know, help bridge those divides as well. And then the last area is just around veterans, veterans um, uh, affairs with a pretty significant focus actually in, in mental, mental health, uh, because that's been an area where there've been a lot of advances and new developments. Um, so yeah, thanks for that question, Stacey. It happens organically, but I'd say one other thing, which is to the listeners out there, like the, 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 the organization with honor action, which is a 501c4 public policy nonprofit, and then also has political action committees, super PACs and PACs, things of that nature. Um, the, the, the public policy arm, along with the members of Congress and the, and the four country caucus, we are always looking for new ideas and ideas of legislation to, to work uh, and, and get behind. So, you know, please, uh, please reach out to us if you have ideas. Thanks. Adam? Yeah, um, Ry, can you maybe talk a little bit and and bring it back to um, like the, the listeners? Um, and I think uh, you know the American Legion has its legislative agenda for for twenty twenty four. So you just you know talked about the national security and voluntary service, and then the veteran affairs things. How do you tie that with what the American Legion is doing for their legislative agenda? How do you kind of partner with them? And then within that. Maybe like the second part to that is the process of uh, identifying these uh, candidates and how does that actually work to be able to go through, like, are they already running or is it something that you guys are actually doing and cultivating? Because, you know, I think maybe there's some alpha listeners out there that might be potential candidates for this program. Yeah, for, for, for sure. And please reach out, by the way. It doesn't necessarily need to be for Congress either. I'll talk about that in a, in, in a moment. But just on, on the first question, Adam. Uh, about the the work that we do with the American Legion and other veteran service organizations, um, we often will will support once a piece once an initiative from the American Legion has bipartisan support uh, and and is brought to a a caucus uh, member, we'll often get behind that as an as an organization. We're not necessarily doing a lot of the heavy lifting on it, but mm -hmm. the caucus is a place where uh, that legislative agenda can can advance. Um, and, and conversely, we also reach out to the Legion for bills like the Afghan Adjustment Act, which the Legion has been amazing on, uh, and then build coalitions of veteran service organizations, which generally is the most effective way of, of getting something passed is when it, when it becomes actually that broad um, across the, the organizations. But our mission is not um, veteran service. Our mission is really polarization, fighting polarization by getting more things done and showing that it is possible to have trust and real relationships across party lines. And so that's our sort of three put. Um, our process for, for uh, recruiting and training uh, candidates is um, 
is is pretty robust. We, we on every election cycle for the last three, we've typically screened about a thousand candidates um, oh, wow. that run for office. Yeah, it's big numbers, and about six hundred to seven hundred of whom are looking for congressional seats in particular. Uh, we started off just focused in the in the House. Uh, we have supported uh, some senators, um, uh, including uh, Reed Wicker, Young, uh, Joni Ernst, Mark Kelly. Um, and then we had our first uh, down ballot race with a gubernatorial candidate, Wes Moore, who's a longstanding friend and was a member of our advisory board. Um, we have uh, endorsed our first municipal uh, candidates uh, this cycle. And, nice. and then we just try and be a truth teller to these individuals if they if they really want to be bipartisan and frankly serve with the, the aspects of our pledge, integrity, civility, and courage. And we mean civility. And we'll look at, you know, the Twitter feeds and the social media and say, okay, well, how are you actually conducting yourself in this mm. crazy in environment? Um, I, I would say one other thing, which is that the Four Country Caucus has, has um, had some members leave because they've decided to go a different route. And so they've had accountability within each other, which we think is also uh, a, a positive attribute. This is a, it's a tough environment. It's not for everyone. It's really important if you're, if you're a listener and you're thinking about running for office, please do reach out to truth tellers because there are a lot of individuals that are not truth tellers out there that are just looking to basically get your business and they make money on candidates who don't win their races. Um, and it's, it's actually a pretty big business because of the, uh, ridiculous amounts of money that is, that is in politics these days. So, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Ray. Joe. So I, I love how positive you are. You know, I did mention the, the optimism quote from, uh, Colin Powell, but, you know, it, but I think part of that is, is having that thing inside you that says I can make a difference. And it's so easy and people are so disenfranchised with the idea of being able to really make a difference with their voting and with their actions uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Plus, I think with with the way that, that things have been financially lately with economics and things like that, a lot of people feel like they're in survival mode, if not because of direct financial issues, but because of the volatility of, of economics in general, it makes you scared. It makes you unwilling to do bold things like start a business, start a nonprofit, buy a new house to progress your life. And so I think since 2020, a lot of us have been stuck in this more cautious mode. How do we reach out to these people who are so jaded and, and get them early enough to make them realize that not only is this hard line left, right thing that we're finding ourselves in not working, but how do we get them making these, these, you know, these, these good habits of getting involved when they feel so disenfranchised with the system as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you, I think this is, this is a feeling that's, that's gripping the, across the United States, uh, you know, for the first time in our lives, uh, some, some surveys are showing that individual like Americans feel like their kids way of life is not going to be, uh, as good as theirs or as bright as their, their, theirs was, um, I had another, we were with another uh, group of older veterans, one of whom was born in 1938 and speculated that maybe it feels a little bit right now, like how his parents felt in 1938, which is the world is, is uncertain. And, um, and there's, a, there are a lot of dangerous things that are happening um, across the, across the country. I, I think, I think you do what you can where, where you can, but I also think that it is helpful to have exposure to service as early as possible. Yeah. So one of the pieces of legislation that passed last, last year that I'm really uh, thrilled about doesn't get much airtime. Guess I'll give it some airtime right, <laughs> right now, thanks to you guys, but is the expansion of JROTC units oh, nice. in um, high schools across the country. And these are in every single congressional district, rural urban schools, and in usually in pretty low income schools where there are a lot of kids that don't have haven't had the good fortune of having two loving parents and, and some security there, um, let alone uh, you know financial security. And these programs matter. They expose kids at a very early age, and they they you know a funny thing happens with service, right? Is that you stop you you think less about yourself, 
Um, and you think more about a mission and therefore you also, it also, you also benefit from that. Um, the other piece that I think is really powerful about like in a, 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 an environment of excellence that many JROTC units create because of instructors who retired from the military and then go back and very selflessly give of themselves is that an environment of excellence enables you to start punching above your weight. Like you see the, 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 the guy or the girl next to you and you say, wow, like they're doing this. I can do something like this. You see the folks that graduated four or five years earlier and they come back. And, um, and so anyways, I, I think it's a, it's a super tough question. I, I certainly don't have all the answers to it. I just try and, you know, do my part where we can and then highlight some of these like positive stories because obviously in the media, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. And oftentimes the, the good news doesn't get through. It's, yeah. you know, you, you, you're a hundred percent right there and showing those people that, you know, they're these, these little things that we do, you don't learn how to get better at things you don't know how to do without putting effort in to do them. Um, you know, you're never going, you, you're unrecognizable a year after going to the gym, first time you walk in and you have to do that with these people. You have to walk in and say, Hey, how can I help you get more involved in JROTC and things like that? And, and, and then learn how to better do that next time. Um, but uh, yeah, I think Stacy's got yeah. something. And I mean, you probably saw, I mean, not to twist the tip, but I mean, I'm, I'm sure you saw some of this with, with your own recovery that, you know, it's easy to go into a dark place. I mean, yeah. it really helps when you have folks that are around you, some of whom are like looking out for each other and positive and pulling each other, pulling each other up. And that's the type of camaraderie that obviously, you know, all of us were fortunate to have because we wore the nation's cloth and we were in units. But for a lot of guys that, that, that and, and ladies, once they get out and put, you know, put up, take off the uniform, they go back home and then you're like, okay, well, where's my community? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? yeah. It's on my, it's on my phone, but this is, this is like a, this isn't a replacement for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned Rye about civic education and I, it, it makes me think about the American Legion's, uh, boy state and the, uh, the auxiliaries girl state and how important that is into giving and empowering knowledge about our democracy and how government works to the next generation. It makes me also think how, how integral and how important is it for, for veterans who do know how to look past um, differences to come together for a common mission and to look past, you know, partisanship. How important is that, is it for our veterans to be mentors? I know you're. We've got the caucus, and they're doing great things. But what can our alphas be doing in their hometowns, in their cities, in their counties to to be improving this in, within our country? Yeah, I mean that's that's the, the, you, that's just hit. I mean you're really hitting it on the boy state and 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 girl state. And basically, you know, and and these JROTC instructors, you know, you don't. Yeah, a lot of change just starts at an individual level. And so, you know, again, just getting out and, and, and building a relationship with somebody that is younger, that's like thinking about where their life's going to go and be a resource for them. Even if you don't feel like there's, a, you, you might not feel like there's a lot that you can necessarily offer, but I guarantee you there's a lot, <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, there's a, there's a, there's a lot you don't know uh, when you're 17 or 18 or even younger. I, I knew everything at 17. I don't know what you're talking about. Exactly. Um, then what you can forget they... it at 21. Oh, this is true. Um, <laughs> I wanted to ask one follow up on that is for the alphas who are listening, who are the JROTC leaders or who are running Boy State Girl Skate? Um, what are some key things that they should be? Um, what What are some key things that they should be passing on to youth that you think um, is most important right now in this in the state that we're in? Well, I personally think that we're we're in this kind of mental health crisis, and and that that is that is a gap in the feeling of purpose and meaning. And so, mm. uh, and we're almost it's almost like we're afraid to talk about uh, character and values. And at the end of the day, this is that's 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 the those are those are the building blocks. And we should, we need to we need to start there and and have real conversations that are that can go into you know actual challenges that, that people are facing and let them, you know, let them know that they're not alone. Right. Uh, it's a role I think that a lot of vets can play in a pretty, pretty profound way. 
You look like you have a question, Adam. I'm going to pass it on to you. Uh, just listening so thoughtfully, I think this is such a, a powerful conversation and discourse for the times that we're living in. So it's obviously about, you know, the work that you're doing and how you find these, you know, candidates that are able to come in and um, with with this integrity, you know, lead in this way. But, uh, you know, I'm also hearing that, you know, it's about how we as as veterans and humans can take, you know, these same values based tenets and apply that to a way of living. And then there's also this lack of, you know, purpose and, and meaning. And then as you apply it, you know, to the veteran you know, space, um, you know, this loss of connection to community and, and tribe. And, you know, Sebastian Younger, who's also a, a guest on this podcast, covers that so nicely in, in his book, you know, Tribe. But it's also that, you know, this is it is indeed a, a sacred space and and truth is important. So I guess more than anything, I'm just kind of reflecting back, you know, what I've heard there. As far as my question, kind of looking forward, what excites you most about this work that we're doing and the impact that it can have for the future, right? Yeah, thanks for thanks for that. I mean, I I we're right in the beginning of the election season, and it is re actually really fantastic to see uh, some of these uh, amazing Americans that are that are raising their hand and and running for office. Uh, Texas and California primaries are like a week away. Uh, one of my co-founders, Peter Dixon, is is actually running. Uh, in California, he's doing an amazing job uh, running running in his race. We have the co-chair of the Four Country Caucus, Tony Gonzalez, who is um, running uh, and getting uh, a primary challenge from his right flank for doing the right thing. And we're having his back, and I'm confident he's going to prevail uh, and and doing really important stuff along the way. He represents the the largest border district in Texas. And so it was just right front and center with this immigration crisis that's happening. And he invited one of his Democratic counterparts, Don Davis, Air Force veteran, African-American from North Carolina, to the border. And they went out and they actually, you know, had real conversations and talked and, and, and thought about, you know, how can we actually constructively solve some of this uh, crisis instead of uh, just prolonging it? So those are some of the things that, that, uh, that really get me excited about you know, where, where we are, despite how easy it is to just get distressed when you start thinking about the, you know, the, uh, the broader election cycle. Awesome. Thanks for that, Rye. All right, Joe, I'll pass it over to you. So, uh, you know, as, as a veteran, you know, sometimes we gloss over it because it's always the really uncomfortable, thank you for your service. But I, I do want to circle back around and let you know, I was a Navy corpsman, served with Marines, went over to Fallujah in 2004, got a little banged up, uh, got a nice parking spot out of it. And uh, I, I just want to say, I, I appreciate that you have continued to, to serve as you've went through your military career, because that's what the American Legion is all about, is, is looking for opportunities to still make a difference. And what you've done is you've knocked holes in the drywall of, of complacency and, and made avenues to serve where no one else was trying to do so. And, uh, and, and I know that it's very forward thinking and I know what you're trying to do and I know how optimistic it is. And I think that's why it's so important because there's so many people that would have given up by now. So if you're ever having a time where you feel like you're not making a difference, the effort sometimes is worth, even if you know you're gonna fail, sometimes it's worth reaching out if, even if you know no one's gonna take your hand. And so I, I say all that to say that we, we are living in a world where politics is becoming a TV show. We, the, you know, the news does not represent what's happening up there. It's, and we have so much freedom of information. We have more opportunity now than we've ever had to really understand and know what's going on. So what do you think, what are you fighting against? What is the, where is the narrative coming from? Because I feel like that's something to like know your enemy. That's something that we're taught, you know, you know, know, know who you would educate yourself on who you're fighting. And so I don't want to say that these people are enemies because the whole goal is to make these people friends. But what is the narrative that you're specifically fighting? And where do you think that that narrative is coming from? Do you think it's social media? Do you think that it's taught in schools and colleges? I mean, I, without getting yourself in trouble here, you know, what, what, what is it that, you know, how, do, how, do, what do we do here? You know, I, I, I feel like I'm all over the place. I feel like I'm taking crazy pills, you know, but, but realistically yeah. it's, what are we fighting and how do we do this? 
Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a pretty profound question because I mean at the end of the day we are fighting ourselves, right? I mean we are ripping ourselves as much as we're gonna we're gonna do a, a unity index to show that we want the same things in life, but we do we are like just at combat with each other, and it's harder and harder to actually find any any middle ground that doesn't end up going the way of of a culture war. But it's so important. I mean, it is so important for like you know, for lots of things that matter and affect people's lives. You know, a good example is um, one of the early uh, pieces of uh, legislation that the the With Honor vets got behind this year is a bill introduced by Jimmy Panetta, who was the co-founder of the Four Country Caucus, along with uh, Don Bacon. And it's uh, Military Food and Security Act. You know, I mean, it's Listen, I, as you guys know, I mean, our, our enlisted, it's, it's nuts that some of our, many of our enlisted uh, servicemen and women are on food stamps. I mean, what are we doing here? We're the wealthiest country in the world still. And, and this exists. And you tell people this and they're like, you tell Americans this and they're like, no, you can't be serious. No, actually, like, we are, we are serious. And wh why haven't we fixed that? The reason why we haven't fixed that is because of our polarization and divisiveness. It makes everything harder. And so, you know, that's what I kind of hold on to as a North Star is that this stuff is still possible when you can actually build a coalition. That's 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 what we got got going is a coalition that can actually get this done. And hopefully that that piece of legislation in particular, which uh, I believe the American Legion is also uh, behind, is um, is hopefully something that gets done with with the farm bill here later later this this year. Uh, but I appreciate that question. I don't have the answer to 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 it. You know, where is the, what is the driving source of of the narrative that's making this so difficult? I think it's clearly a reflection of who we are. Clearly, social media has a major impact on this, um, and just re the complete removal of filters and people feeling like it's okay to to not be civil with each other, to attack each other, and then run away and and hide and um or be anonymous and obviously those things just um they're just not right it's not the right thing to do and uh we need to we need to highlight uh and then put into positions of leadership those individuals that can still take the high ground even when it's not the easy thing to do mm. to remind people like you said that we want the same things you know yeah. we want shelter of our heads we want to be able to make money and buy a nice car every once in a while or or you know but until we get out of this sort of survival mode mindset, it's, it's tough. Yeah. I think Stacy's got something for you here too. Yeah. I just say one one other thing too. Thanks thanks on mentioning your service in Fallujah. I uh, had the privilege of serving there, and uh, uh, I guess privilege would be a way to put it uh, in two thousand five and two thousand six. And um, you mentioned the the complacency factor, and I just I often think about when I'm when I'm starting to feel like I'm, uh, you know losing losing my edge on something or just you know get it feeling like it's this is frustrating and we ought to like hang up the towel the uh the sign that we would spray paint on the ford operating bases right as we were heading out which was that complacency kills you know it's, <laughs> yeah once you, once you once you let that trigger switch that's when um that's that's when bad bad stuff can happen so and, and you know there's a pressure of having people lean on you too you know when i do things because yeah you know, i got a prosthetic on the left side my and so people see me doing things and living my life normally, and it's a weird thing to have people look up to you for just functioning. Um, but, but you know, but I, I admittedly, I can admit that there are days when there's push through there, there's perseverance there, there's there's things like that, and so that's that's what I really wanted to just remark on with you is to just to make sure you knew, um, because you didn't ask for it, that that it's recognized how hard working because what you're doing is uh you know an uphill an uphill battle and you got people throwing rocks at you sometimes you know it, it it's your own people like <laughs> you know sometimes it's your own people so i i appreciate that thanks yeah i appreciate appreciate it joe i mean anything like trying to get anything done that matters in the world you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna hit resistance and you're gonna hit some of the haters <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you're gonna run into some of the haters and then you know just keep keep pushing pushing ahead and with politician politics in particular, like, listen, I mean, I, I have to stay, I stay completely neutral, you know, et cetera, but I have my own views on things. And, um, you know, you, I, one thing that I've learned over the last five years is that at its core in an environment this broken, 
and challenging, every one of these politicians is going to disappoint. Like they're going to disappoint on some level. It's just impossible not to as a, as a human, but try and try and like <laughs> recognize those that are, uh, that are still focused on doing the right thing, not the easy thing. And mm -hmm. there are a lot that are there. There are a lot that are there. And, um, and that's, that's a pathway for us, I think, to, to get out of our, uh, our current rut. Right. I think, um, you know, improvement, not perfection. I think that's kind of the goal, right? Um, and so all, all you alphas out there listening, if you want to run for office, give with honor a chat. Um, they're ready to back you and support you and guide you through. And you got to make that commitment to, you know, compromise. That's what it's all yeah, about. Yeah. And, we, and, we, and we'll tell you the truth too. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's a, there's uh there's not not a small number of vets that come to us and say you know i'm thinking about running this in this race which is an impossible race to win you know and so we'll 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 say that as well and uh not everybody out there will say that the the, 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 su the suicide missions uh so to speak uh will it's important to be like clear-headed about this and say okay this is if i because if you do take that leap it's a lot especially for those of us that are you know um around our generation, right? And you're, you're, you're raising a family, there are a ton of trade-offs, there are a ton of opportunity costs that are involved in this. And you should just, you know, know the facts and go in, go in clear headed, but the country definitely needs more, more service, whether that's an elected capacity or, or, uh, or in other ways. And I think it's going to get harder. I, I think it's going to get harder because, you know, we've got the Xbox call of duty generation jumping in now and there's, you know, an online everybody was stupid in their teen years and and all this stuff is out there for everyone to see now oh yeah thank god i i didn't have facebook <laughs> yeah, <laughs> me too. i think we're the last bastion of uh the cutoff for that though guys tom and tom on myspace might have some dirt on us but we ain't heard anything from him so oh boy well rye we really appreciate you and your time that you spent with us today and for fielding all these questions enlightening us and uh before we sign off is there anything that you would like to share that we haven't quite covered yet? Maybe something the alphas need to hear from you. No, thanks so much, Stacey. I, and Adam, Joe, thanks for having me on. American Legion is, is a, a really important uh, American institution. And, and it, it is important for our generation to uh, continue to participate in it as an organization and keep it dynamic um, and stay focused on service and getting, and getting more Americans to serve in many different capacities. Uh, including elected office. And so, no, we really appreciate it. If uh, if viewers want to check us out, please do um, at withhonor.org and sign up. We'd love to have you uh, follow the organization and um, and then, you know, look for ways to support not only the vets in Congress that are doing the right thing that, that we support, but also uh, others in your local community. Wonderful. We'll have all the links to your social network channels and your website in the show notes. Thank you. Right. Thanks so much for visiting us today for the uh, authentic conversation, for the so important impact driven work that you and your organization's doing and how you show up with honor uh, all along the way. Um, Alpha, stick around for some scuttlebutt after the break. The American Legion is raising awareness about PTSD and veteran suicide by offering hope, camaraderie and support. Be the one to help end veteran suicide. Be the one to save one veteran. Be the one to ask a veteran in your life how they're doing. Be the one to reach out when a veteran is struggling. Go to betheone.org and help the American Legion end veteran suicide. Will you be the one? Okay, Alphas, we hope you had a great break. Now it's time for some scuttlebutt. Joe, what do you got? Ham gets the slammer. So on June 3rd, 2013, President Barack Obama signed into law the American Legion Back Stolen Valor Act of 2013. I think we've all seen a couple of different uh, benefits of that. Some of them, you know, very, very justice oriented. And I think we'd like to see, I think there's a Navy SEAL guy that goes around. And that's what he does. He just hunts these people down and makes sure that they don't make money off of their stolen valor. But <clears throat> it made it a federal crime for an individual to fraudulently hold oneself out to be a recipient of any of several spe specified military decorations or medals with the intent to obtain money, property, or other tangible benefit. So get this, Tyler, a Texas man, um, a Tyler, Texas man, sorry, Derek Robert Hamm invented a persona of being a wealthy and successful war hero. 
and held himself to be a former member of the Army Special Forces. Does the Army have Special Forces? Anyway, who had served multiple tours of duty in Iraq, Afghanistan, and other countries. He claimed to have been awarded a Purple Heart, Bronze Star, Silver Star. That's getting fancy. And a Distinguished Service Cross for his service. Ham also used stolen dollar for his own personal benefit when in 2020, he presented falsified military records to a Smith County, Texas district court and successfully leveraged into a more lenient sentence. So he used these same false documents to obtain Bronze Star license plates from the Texas Department of Motor Vehicles. And if you really want to get specific with that, that probably got him out of a few tickets too. the nerve of this dude. So in the end, Ham's deception was discovered, and on December 8th, 2023, all came crashing down. He was sentenced to 11 years in federal prison for multiple viol 11 years for multiple violations of the stolen valor law. He pled guilty to wire fraud, money laundering, violating stolen valor act, using a fraudulent military discharge certificate, and being a felon in possession of firearms and ammunition. He was sentenced to 135 months in federal prison by U.S. District Judge J. Campbell Barker. Campbell Barker. Ham's sentence was the largest ever imposed in relation to a fraud scheme involving the Stolen Valor Act. So, so as part of his sentence, he agreed to pay 2.3 million, which means he probably made more than that, in forfeiture of the proceeds of his criminal conduct, including jewelry, automobiles, and cash proceeds, with the amount of 1.675. 1.675 million. So what do you guys think about that? Do you think it was too harsh or not enough? Well, I'm just going to say that anybody who does stolen valor probably really doesn't know what it what it means to serve and what that sacrifice means or what those medals really mean. I'm I it gets frustrating. You know, those who really honor their service aren't really the ones that are out there making sure everybody knows about it. And um, it's it's folks like this who are just doing it for whether they're attention seeking or in, in the case of this guy's um, audacity, um, trying to get money that doesn't really belong to him, which is going to to him instead of somebody who probably really needs it. Now, he got 11 years of federal prison time. I guess that's probably due in large part to the felony firearms and ammunition possession, yeah, I would imagine. Um, and maybe like one year of that is probably due to stolen valor, uh, which, hey, at least they're starting to call some people out and and there's starting to be some ramifications for for doing that. Uh, so well, good, good thing on the governments for putting the crack down. Um, and then you were talking about that Navy SEAL guy who's out there on social media. I, I've seen that and it makes me so uncomfortable. Oh, I know. Um, you know, because here's the thing, Joe, and I'm just going to flip the script here. People accuse me of stealing valor all the time. Really? They see my disabled veteran license plate and make a lot of assumptions that aren't true. So it can be go. It could go two ways. Adam? That's, you know, though, I, I feel like there's, two types of people that do this. There are people that are looking for that financial bump and, and, or attention, but it, a lot of that stems initially from mental health and then it gets out of hand. You mm. know, you have people that, that at the core, when it first starts, it's kind of sad. They're so desperate to be recognized and to be a part of something. And for various reasons, now, sometimes they just didn't serve. They never tried. And then sometimes it could be something like, you know, asthma or being flat-footed. I mean, it could be such a silly little thing, but instead of getting involved in, in something, you know, like an auxiliary or something like that to try and support people who did serve, they, they, you know, they start a lie and then it gets away from them. It doesn't mm -hmm. make it okay, but it's, you know, at the, at the core of this, as angry as it makes me, it's really just sad. It's sad. And that's, I that's I my... I agree with everything that you guys have said. And it's funny because I remember hearing more about stolen valor, maybe, you know, in the early 2000s to 2015, maybe the earlier parts of yeah. war, you know, just maybe because the nation was so focused on it. And, you know, if you, if you remember around that time, it's like if you were in your uniform anywhere, like you couldn't go anywhere without, you know, being thanked. Like the country was so absolutely wonderful about it. So I think in part, you know, the conditions were set for like the broken individual, like you're talking about, Joe, 
that's wanting or seeking that kind of validation that that goes out and and sees this, you know, opportunity. But I but I think when you really boil it down, I mean, it's one of the most terrible things that you can do to take and and live in a lie, but then take somebody who has selfless sacrifice, honor, integrity, personal courage, courage, and then you're laying on some some of like, <laughs> um, you know, the most uh, her, heroic. Uh, achievements one can do in, in that service all for personal gain. Well, um, like there's a word for that and it's evil. Mm. It is stolen too. And, and that's one thing, you know, I think that we, you know, there's, there's, it's a victimless crime outside of the people who donated money or whatever. Like it doesn't hurt a veteran, but it, it you know, Stacy mentioned it does. These are benefits. He got vehicles and, and how, I mean, could you imagine? I, I know what it was like, how helpless I felt when I got hurt trying to figure out what am I going to do with my family? I can't even work anymore. The way that, that everything that I've ever known, I've always been physical. I didn't go into the military because I, you know, I couldn't go back in as a officer or anything, you know, in the Air Force if I was Air Force because I, I, did, I went in as, you know, as enlisted. And so my options were very limited and I needed, you know, organizations stepped up. And, and, you know, and then you build a community around yourself of great people, you know, got a little bit involved in American Legion and they showed up when, when, you know, before I even knew who they were, what, you know, what they, they were, you know, what they lived for. And so, you know, I, it, it is stolen, it is taken. And I think that because, you know, of that, it's, I feel like the, the crime is, is, is fitting. Um, if you want to know more, there's a uh, link. Um, that we will have on the website for you. Psychedelic fast track. A few weeks ago, methylene dioxymethamphetamine, say that four times fast, Joe, or MDMA. MDMA, was a, MDMA, MDMA. There you go. <laughs> That's how they say it in the Marines. Uh, was approved for fast track review by the US FDA. We've had guests on both this podcast as well as Be The One podcast who've talked about their positive experiences with MDMA assisted therapy, philanthropically funded private research has founded similar results. According to the military times article that we'll link in the show notes, the multidisciplinary association of psychedelic studies or maps conducted a trial in which more than 86% of participants who receive the MDMA assisted therapy for PTSD experience clinically meaningful improvements. 18 weeks after starting the trial. Wow. Additionally, more than 71% of participants no longer met the diagnostic criteria for PTSD at the end of the study. Remarkable. The fast track review designation means that the FDA will shorten their timelines for review from 10 months to six and direct overall attention and resources to study the drugs that if approved would allow for improvements in the safety or effectiveness of this treatment, diagnosis, or prevention of serious conditions, according to the FDA website. They are targeting August 11th to conclude their evaluation. In the article, my friend and former podcast guest, Juliana Mercer, Director of Veteran Advocacy for the group Healing Breakthroughs, and also a member of the Veteran Mental Health Leadership Coalition, made the statement, we're grateful to those in Washington, DC, who are working overtime to pave the way for MDMA's acceptance and approval. The federal government is putting skin in the game after decades of philanthropically funded private research. What do you think this, about this, Joe and Stacy? This is huge. You don't want to be on the wrong side of history on this. I, you just don't want to be. You don't want to be one of those people that slows this down because the effect that it's having and the speed that it's doing it is, it just blows my mind. I think it could help people that are dealing with, with PTSD from homelessness and drug use. It can help people that have survived, um, you know, all kinds of trauma, uh, including, you know, anything from war to domestic violence. Like these are, this is massive. This is massive. So this is yeah. going for approval, approval by the FDA. And it's also worth noting that MDMA and, and psilocybin or, or magic mushrooms have already been granted breakthrough therapy designation by the FDA. So in 2017 for MDMA and I think 2018 for, for psilocybin, the FDA have already said that these medicines 
are significantly better than what's currently available for certain conditions like treatment resistant depression and they're not habit forming so that's what that has to actually happen for it to be designated as a breakthrough therapy so what this article talks about and i encourage you to go check it out and i, and I want to hear from you too on this um stacy but um this is actually approval to be administered by like a doctor in mm -hmm. in a clinic to or a therapist and, and so part of this is defining like, what are the certifications, you know, who can administer that? And so that's some of the work to come from this, but it, but it is really exciting. I think what MDMA suffers from is its previous identity as a street drug. And I think that goes along with even, um, THC or, or things like that, that are found to be, um, therapeutic. So I wonder if, if you know, you know, if we can change how we view MDMA, for instance, um, maybe in conservative states like I live in South Carolina, where um, even the use of marijuana is still prohibited, um, we could have uh, a much more progressive view on this particular type of therapy. Because as Joe reiterated, that it, it seems like the success stories outweigh anything that could possibly be ne on the negative side. And if it's administered on a, under a clinical um, setting, what I mean, I can't see a whole lot going wrong. And the people that would be treating them would be there to help. I mean, and they're in some of these people are in real distress. You know, PTSD is something that grows with neglect. And, and if there's a way to, to nip something like this in the bud, holy cow. I mean, the suicide rates with people that have lived through traumatic events, whether it was war or not, are, are just drastically higher than the average person. And, and we we're finding ways to mitigate that. And if we don't use it, I, like I said, you don't want to be on the wrong side of history on this one. I, I throw your sport behind something like this. Uh, agreed. And, and I, I think veterans are also leading on the front lines of this. I mean, obviously Ju Julian is a, a Marine veteran, um, the work that we do at the Veteran Mental Health Leadership Coalition is advocating at the state and the federal level, you know, for these medicines. And, you know, to your point, Stacey, we do have to overcome, you know, the drug culture and the war on drugs of, of the 60s. And veterans are really helping to do that. But they're partnering with, you know, the universities, the doctors, the scientists, with the data that supports um, how it's having an impact on the lives. <clears throat> like Joe is talking about. And um, we're sharing our experience with these of overcoming some of the, the worst things, you know, TBI, PTSD, the wars of, you know, uh, the, the traumas of, of war uh, in service and helping to, to educate and say, look, we're not asking for widespread legal access. Like we're not just saying turn on the faucet and make this available for everybody. You know, through the right uh, parameters, screenings, um, settings, uh, certifications for those to administer. And then a really big side of this, too, is how do we integrate those experiences into the life, into healthier ways of living going forward? So it's a really exciting time. Uh, you can check out the link to the article in our show notes. So thanks. All right, we're going to switch gears a little bit here, and I'm going to talk to you guys about a celebrity veteran. So fun fact, Alphas, before he became, quote, the dude, Academy Award winning actor Jeff Bridges was just uh, one dude from around the block who joined the Coast Guard Reserves. And you heard that right, Jeff Bridges, the son of the renowned Hollywood actor Lloyd Bridges. Um, well, he followed in his father's bootsteps by serving from 1967 to 1975 as a boatswain's mate. That's such a mouthful, boatswain's yeah. mate. You anyway. always feel like you're saying it wrong. Swains. Yes. So like okay. gyro or euro. Um, yeah, it's weird. But hey, so Jeff's older brother, Bo, also served in the Coast Guard Reserves. Jeff was a minor celebrity before enlisting and then managed to balance his career acting with his reserve service. He actually received two Academy Award nominations for two films while he was serving. Fun fact. Though his military career was short-lived, uh, Petty Officer Second Class Bridges attributes his Coast Guard service for teaching him about hard work and discipline. So thank you for your service, Jeff Bridges, if you're listening. Come be a guest on Tango Alpha Lima. And I loved it's you in Starman. Like your opinion, man. 
I, I like them in Tron. It's funny because I, 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 I that's what I was gonna say. I thought Tr the Tron remake was his best. I re I loved it, and I know the CGI. I just wish they'd waited. Like I like the actors. I like what they did. Some people complain about it, but you're never going to be able to make a movie, a sequel that far apart, and make everybody happy. I don't know what people are complaining about. I loved it. Um, what's his name that played Frodo? Did a voice acting for the cartoon that I watched with my kids too. The Tron cartoon. That was great. I like everything Tron I can get my hands on. Yeah, but his uh, dude is iconic. iconic. I mean, in, in the early 2000s, I mean, I remember with my brothers, we would like wear robes and we would like have a, a Friday night and we would just <laughs> only drink white Russians. It's like also <laughs> like like any alcoholic beverage with milk in it, like just terrible idea. But, you know, you know, it's funny, <laughs> though, because like I just rewatched it and I forgot. I mean. What made that really work was everybody like it, you have to watch and just watch John Goodman and see how he glued these eccentric characters together, because the whole point of the movie. Is like so unclear the whole time, and so it's almost like a character movie that you're watching and and, you know, John Goodman, I I'd love to have anybody from 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 that movie on course. But Jeff Bridges, we're waiting on yeah, you. So Jeff, I'm going to hold my breath. Listening, and we'd love to have you on uh, Tango Alpha Lima. So don't forget, tomorrow is Military Women Wednesday, which means we'll have another bonus episode of our special series, Trailblazing Women Veterans. So tomorrow's episode will feature The Angels of Anzio, the heroic story of four World War II nurses who earned the silver stars they fought to save lives on a beach known as Hell's Half Acre. Um, this is the opposite of Stolen Valor. This is valor grasped in in the hands of possibly painted nails i don't know i just pictured that in my head if you're already subscribed to our podcast you don't have to do a thing the bonus episode will just turn up in your feed like magic if you're not already subscribed you can do that as well subscribe to our newsletter and send us a mail and guest recommendations at legion.org backslash tango alpha lima thanks for listening alphas we'll see you next week